Hello and welcome to this ALS video presentation on humanism and Christianity. All the quotations from the Bible will be taken from the New King James Version. Let's start by considering a definition of humanism. Collins English Dictionary defines humanism as a rationalist movement that holds that man can be ethical and find self-fulfillment etc without recourse to supernaturalism. There are some related words which sound very similar, like humane, which means kind, merciful and compassionate, and humanitarian, someone who is devoted to promoting the welfare of humanity. That word humanism aptly illustrates the point. Humanism is man-centred. Humanism maintains that man is capable of improving his own quality of life, the condition of society and the world in general. The assumption is made that man is basically good. As the definition said, man can be ethical, a word which refers to standards of conduct and moral judgment. There are aspects of humanitarianism which come into the stated goals and objectives of humanism. Our next slide contains extracts from the Humanism Manifesto. There were actually two manifestos produced, the first in 1933 and the second in 1973. In the first manifesto, the 14th paragraph, it says that the goal of humanism is a free and universal society in which people voluntarily and intelligently cooperate for the common good. And in the second manifesto, some 40 years later, happiness and the creative realization of human needs and desires individually and in shared enjoyment are continuous themes of humanism. We strive for the good life, here and now. Part of the previous definition included that phrase without recourse to supernaturalism. Humanists reject belief in any form of life after death. It is then logical that the maximum benefit should be sought for in this life, here and now. By contrast, the hope of the true Christian is focused on the fulfillment of God's purpose with mankind revealed in the Bible. He will intervene by the return of his son Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God on this earth. This future event will achieve the perfection of the world. The next slide addresses the question of creation or evolution. A quotation from the first manifesto and the first paragraph says that religious humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. And the second paragraph of that same manifesto says that humanism believes that man is a part of nature and that he has emerged as a result of a continuous process. Modern humanism rejects the concept of creation and accepts the theory of evolution first propounded by Charles Darwin in the 19th century, essentially that life emerged from a primeval soup, and man is the highest form of developed life from this process. This clearly opposes the teaching of the Bible in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. And in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, it says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Without recourse to supernaturalism, put very plainly means there is no God. And this next slide of extracts from the manifestos clearly expresses this view of the humanist. We are convinced that the time has passed for theism, deism, modernism and the several varieties of new thought. Theism is a belief in one God who is the creator. Deism is belief in the existence of God based on reason and the time has passed for belief in such. And in the second manifesto, the first paragraph, we find insufficient evidence for belief in the existence of a supernatural. It is either meaningless or irrelevant to the question of survival and fulfillment of the human race. As non-theists, we begin with humans, not God. Nature, not deity. 
The Bible has very clear words to say in Psalm 14, verses 1 to 4. The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call on the Lord? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And in the context of those words, a fool is not someone intellectually stupid. Some of the most intelligent and highly qualified people are professed atheists and humanists. It is someone who rejects the convincing evidence that there is a God. And we note from the words of that psalm that the inevitable consequence of such an attitude that rejects God is moral corruption. Let's now look at another slide which has extracts about the source of moral standards that humanists would appeal to. We affirm that moral values derive their source from human experience. Ethics, and there's that word again, it refers to standards of conduct and moral judgment. Ethics is autonomous and situational, needing no theological or ideological sanction. Ethics stems from human need and interest. We reject all religious, ideological or moral codes that denigrate the individual, suppress freedom, dull intellect, dehumanize personality. We almost hear an echo of a phrase that comes from the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Every man does that which is right in his own eyes. But true Christians believe that because God formed man, he knows how men should behave for their own good. The Christian therefore tries to conform his own way of life to the directions set out by God in the Bible. Humanism has been eminently successful in turning the minds of masses of people away from God. Could it be anything but popular when it supports the rights of the individual to freedom of self-expression, self-determination and self-indulgence? The Christian, though, heeds the warning given by Peter in his second letter. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. And that bondage that Peter refers to is slavery to sin. The Lord Jesus Christ makes this very clear in John's Gospel, chapter 8, when Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. The antidote to that Jesus has already mentioned in verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now consider these words of Paul. They are set against the background of the decadent Roman society of the first century AD, but there are some striking similarities with modern Western societies. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The Christian readily admits his desperate need for salvation from sin and death and recognises that God has provided for that need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then verse 18 goes on, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Those who reject God and suppress his truth will ultimately suffer his judgment. 
verse 19, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The wonders of the natural world and complexity of life in itself is a powerful witness to the existence of a supernatural designer and creator, so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And we have an echo back to Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In a deliberate rejection of God, professing and preferring worldly wisdom, they became fools. Verse 24, therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. If people are determined to reject God and seek to satisfy their own desires then God will give them up to those desires. They become slaves to sin. For this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one for another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Here is a clear reference to lesbianism and homosexuality. But God does not single out just the gay community for criticism and condemnation. He includes a long list of other sins which are unacceptable to him. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. All practices of sexual immorality are condemned, including sex before marriage, often referred to in the Bible as fornication, and unfaithfulness of husbands and wives referred to as adultery. The list is not just to do with sex. Take that word covetousness, for example. In modern terms we might say that covetousness is an obsession with materialism. We want more than we have got. We want what others have and we do not have. Related words would be selfishness and self-indulgence. A Christian is just as prone to such sins. The next slide makes very clear the vital importance of moral standards. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators nor idolaters and Sometimes that word idolater is referred to as a man who is covetous. Nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. What is the humanist policy on sexual moral standards? 
Neither do we wish to prohibit by law or social sanction sexual behaviour between consenting adults. The many varieties of sexual exploration should not in themselves be considered evil. Short of harming others or compelling them to do likewise, individuals should be permitted to express their sexual proclivities and pursue their lifestyles as they desire. Moral education for children and adults is an important way of developing awareness and sexual maturity. Such statements are in clear contradiction to God's standards. We are constantly being bombarded by various forms of media, television, video, cinema, newspapers, and it all has an effect and an influence upon our thinking. Look at this next slide. It's a quotation from a Mr. Dunphy. I am convinced, he says, that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers, a word which means someone who converts others from one religion or belief to another. Teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith, a religion of humanity. The classroom must and will become the arena of conflict between the rotting corpse of Christianity and the new faith of humanism. Very strong words. That was written in 1983. What progress have humanists made in this battle? What does go on in our schools with our children and our grandchildren? This next slide, although presented in the form of a cartoon, actually has a very serious implication. It depicts a booklet that teachers are meant to use in primary schools when talking to their classrooms about issues such as racism. It's entitled, What? Me? A Racist? But it is not just about racism and religious freedom. It places sexual preferences in the same category. Children are encouraged to explore different views about gender roles, sexuality, as well as cultural beliefs. They are urged to make their own decisions based on how each individual feels about his or her sexual orientation. And add to this messages that are continually coming across from the media of TV, videos, cinemas, pop music, where the right of the individual is emphasized to decide for himself or herself upon such issues as premarital sex, adultery, divorce and abortion. Children are also encouraged to champion the cause of minorities who appear to be unequally treated. Any intolerance of another person's morality is labelled discrimination and can lead to legal prosecution. You can be anything you like, but not moralistic. Explicit sex education is given in schools on the assumption that sexual activity is occurring or will soon. Emphasis is placed upon avoiding the consequences of unwanted pregnancies or HIV or AIDS, rather than upon the issue of whether it's right or whether it's wrong. In this battle for our minds and our children's minds, the Christian has recourse to a very powerful weapon. It is the Bible, the Word of God. This next quotation from Romans makes reference to the way in which the Word of God can influence our minds and help us in this battle against wrong thinking. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul's appeal to the Christian is based on reason, because God has shown his mercy toward us, to the extent of giving us his beloved Son as our Saviour. It is reasonable.
for him to expect willing service from us. The Christian accepts that the Bible reveals the mind of his creator. As he absorbs the word of God into his own mind, so he will develop God-like characteristics. This next slide, entitled Humanism and Christianity, really brings these issues to a sharp focus. Humanism and Christianity cannot exist side by side in a person's thinking. They are diametrically opposed. It's a quotation from the director of the British Humanist Association. Now Christ, he says, as a human personality, is an enigma. But as a standard and pattern, there is no doubt or obscurity about him. He is the archetype of unqualified submission and obedience to the will of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It is impossible to follow Christ on any other terms, and the humanist finds acceptance of such terms a violation of himself and his whole experience. His rejection of Christ is therefore categorical. He can do no other. Very strong, very hard-hitting words. But at least Mr. Blackham is honest, and Christians would do well to take note of those terms in which he expresses the following of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is one or the other, humanism or Christianity, the choice has to be made. This quotation shows us the challenge that the Lord Jesus Christ places before us. Then he, Jesus, said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? and is himself destroyed or lost. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. True Christianity is not about striving for the good life here and now. The Christian looks forward to the return of Christ in glory to establish God's kingdom on earth and reward the faithful with eternal life. Humanism is attractive to human thinking. It has the high ideal and ultimate goal of a better world for all. But its fatal flaw is that God is rejected from the picture. Humanism promises freedom of thought, of choice and of action. But in reality, it is a license for self-indulgence and only serves to enmesh individuals into the slavery of sin and death. Our last set of quotes are taken from Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 6. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. True Christianity provides a freedom from the dominating and destructive power of sin, which ends in death, eternal death. But now, Having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end, everlasting life. It is not a freedom to do whatever we want. For the faithful Christian will seek to please his Lord God and Jesus Christ, not to please himself. The glorious prospect set before us as a gracious gift from God is everlasting life, free from sin, suffering, pain and death, in a perfectly restored world 
the kingdom of God on earth, ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible makes our choice clear and the end result plain. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.